Joining us now is Johnny Hon Wilson, the director of the Pearl of Africa. Okay, we're live. I actually have a different setup now, as you can see. Uh, this is uh, a totally different setup. I usually use the Ursa for the live stream. Before that, I had the C300. Now I'm actually using the Blackmagic uh, Cinema Camera MFT, and it's being routed through uh, the Ultra Studio from Blackmagic which means that I can mix stuff on the computer. So I actually have everything hooked up. I might go through all of this another time, but the whole setup is pretty interesting because uh, I can actually, like I, I can have everything set up and mix it live uh, with OBS, which is something that Maddie showed me. Uh, apparently all the gamers know about this, but I didn't. Uh, and I used to use Wirecast and I felt like that's too advanced of a program for me to use. So this is it. Uh, hopefully this is going to work better. I can hopefully do like live sessions as well with grading and that sort of thing in the future. So let me know what type of sessions you want because this setup actually makes it easy for me to kind of give critique or do all kinds of stuff. Because, uh, for instance, with a little push of a button, I can get the chat uh, in here, uh, which is kind of sweet. Um, I don't know why it's taking so long to update, but there we go. Um, so that's kind of nice. Uh, and I don't know if everybody's used to this or if I'm the only newbie using OBS, but apparently, like, I... I love it. It's so much more professional to be mixing it like this. Uh, we'll see how it works though, because it's the first time. So there might be some technical glitches just because I don't. First question, Omar asks, film school, yay or nay? Mm, it depends on what you want to do. If you have an opportunity to like work with somebody that's more experienced, that's usually a better way to go. And the main reason for that is that you can build a network that's professional. When you go to school, you also build a network, but it's not a professional network that will maybe lead to jobs right now. It's more the stuff that will kind of change your career as they come up, they get established in the industry. Then you start like having uh, use of that network. But if you want to get work and if you want to go into things, you need to uh, pretty much do that through uh, working uh, in the industry and that's not so easy if you go to school uh, i also think that if you work with somebody that's talented rather than listening to like a, a professor or something you will learn much more like the best teachers that i've had is definitely the ones that are like workshop teachers that um, they are part of the whole course that like I've studied. So for instance, I studied like cinematography with Roy Anderson's uh, DOPs. That's the best stuff that I got out of film school. The rest was just like stuff you could have read in any book. Uh, so if you have those workshop teachers that you get access to, it can be good. It can also be good if you get funded for doing films, which you do at the most prominent film school, you get a budget. That can make it easy for you to get into festivals as well. So it's a bit of like doing research and finding out uh, if it's worthwhile for you. In general though, I think if you want to work and get paid for doing films, it's probably not film school that is the way to do it. It's more about working. And either you do that after film school or during both works. Okay, so let's see here. Um, good evening from Singapore. Hey, Singapore. Cool hat. Yeah, thank you. I uh, should use it more often, but it's a bit warm now, so can't really use it all the time. I'm doing fine. Uh, actually, like, I'm super good now because I got home and I <laughs> was all jet lagged. I woke up at like 1 a.m. in the morning for a while, for a couple of days, and now I'm actually on track, so that's sweet. Uh, Stream just died. That's weird. So what happened then? Let me just check the 
browser here what it's saying. It says health good. Stream is continuing. Stream resumed. Okay, that's weird. First uh, technical glitch. Anybody that's used uh, OBS before, any idea why it would just drop out and then come back? Uh, let me know, because usually I've used the encoder that I have from Teradek. That's pretty flawless. It just streams to YouTube and all that. Uh, this is a new setup, so bear with me. And if you know anything that I don't know, please tell me. Um, what are your thoughts on the Kinefinity Terra 4K? Uh, that's what I'm saying up for, lol. I think it looks like an amazing camera. Yeah, I think that the only thing you should kind of look out for when you buy cameras like that is basically how much access you have to, you know, fixing it and sending it in and, and doing those things if things happen. It's easier with like bigger brands that are everywhere. Uh, otherwise, it looks like a fantastic camera. I think that it, it's, it's what's needed. Those types of cameras are breaking new ground and making the bigger uh, camera manufacturers uh, change their game up which is all good like all the newcomers like black magic was once upon a time they changed the other people like the other brands have to adapt because the demand is there uh, i think for instance canon cameras are totally overpriced that's an issue that you know you're gonna have if you want to buy a cinema camera from them uh, i think that if they would have wanted the market for everything they would have just made like a 5d that had the raw stuff basically they would have made a black magic pocket 4k if they would have made that then everybody would be happy that's the size that i like working with i don't like the big cinema cameras for uh, the dock shoots sometimes it's nice but mainly it's just like clumsy to move around with especially if you're all alone so big cinema camera like the ursa or the uh, Kinefinity Terra is yeah, good cameras if you have that type of productions and it's amazing with an easy rig you gotta have an easy rig um, dropped out weird how the chat just dropped out <laughs> that hasn't happened to me before uh, all right, Pete says hi from Canada. Hey, Pete. Uh, Damien from France. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, so I'm just bringing the shot up so you guys can see. That's part of OBS, the good stuff. Uh, did you go to film school? I did, but it's a shitty film school. I went to like, uh, first I went to one post-production film school. So I did uh, like After Effects and color grading and editing and all that. And then I, and 3D modeling and 3D animation and that type of stuff. And then eventually I kind of, I lost interest in it and I started making uh, fictional films. And then I applied for uh, a photography course, I think after that, that was like three years. I went to a photography school, still photography. I wanted to be a photographer for a while. And then that's what I pursued. But at the same time, I also studied film production for a year. Uh, I just jumped on like the second year of, of some education, which is pretty crappy. Kulturama for the Swedes, who would know? Uh, it's not a good film school by any means, but it's like a place where you can get to produce stuff. Uh, it's not a high level school at all. Um, it's pretty much what you go to before you go to university type of stuff in Sweden. Um, I don't like it. I don't think that it's worth the money. I think that you can do everything online. You can buy courses or you can just follow YouTube channels or follow filmmakers as they make stuff today. So I, I think it's kind of unnecessary. It's more important to get into the industry. And uh, if you go out and you kind of assist somebody, that's what you get. But you also need to make a living. And yeah, you need to solve that either with like an extra job for something else. Or you work with film and do like random stuff or work as an assistant to an editor, whatever, you know, pays the bills. Uh, okay, so much action in this chat. Uh, let me just take another one from this list here. Uh, 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 love the 1500 uh, budget setup. However, I can't find the lens you recommended. Uh, anywhere used or new in Netherlands. Any 
alternative lens suggestions. <clears throat> I mean, I think I ordered it from SLR Magic. Uh, it's a solid website, like they do a lot of stuff. The lens that I'm using now on this one is the SLR Magic 10 millimeter, which is a nice prime as well. Um, but a 12 millimeter is so compact, so I, I just like the, the form factor you get out of that one. Uh, but I would order it from there or from the UK one, because I think they have a UK uh, retailer or something. So if you look up SLR Magic, you'll probably get like forwarded to a UK site where you could buy it. Um, otherwise, I think eBay would be your best pick, because uh, usually you can find something there. But you're probably going to have to send it because it's such a small brand. Um, yeah. Okay. So, let me see. Chat is going. This is kind of funny that you see this whole control room here. Uh, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but anyway. Uh, let me get the chat on big screen instead. I'll just take another one from this while this... Or maybe that's why it's dropping out. Okay, I'll just stick to this which is working right now. Uh, okay, so let me just get... I should probably move this to this screen. So... I look in your way <laughs> instead of looking a separate way. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Where is the chat? Here we go. Uh, Pete says uh, Johnny bought those books you recommended. They're excellent. Thank you. Yeah, they, I think they are too. Like the story one, I usually reread a lot of the time when I'm starting a new project uh, just to kind of refresh. Uh, the other one I lost at some point, but I want to reread it, so I should probably buy it again. Uh, which is the a Rebel Without a Crew by Robert uh, Rodriguez. Also a good book. Like super inspiring if you want to go out and just make stuff and don't, uh, you know, want to be stopped by an uh, establishment or anything. Uh, 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 let's see. Hi from Poland. Hey Poland. Uh, what are your social media personal branding tips for doc filmmakers? Mm, I think there's like two separate things you can do. One is to target the industry, and and that's kind of hard. I feel so. I wouldn't. I would probably not recommend that because I don't think it's like a viable way of marketing yourself. I think that's pretty hard. When you do it for advertising stuff, then that's actually a way that you can get people to, to notice you and, and that's the way you get work. I don't think that's the case for docs. Uh, I think it's, it's such an old fashioned uh, way of working that it doesn't work as well. So I would probably just focus on you as a filmmaker. Try to make, uh, let me just stop this. Why am I? Okay, I was streaming and uh, that probably takes some bandwidth, so I just wanted to stop it. Uh, but anyway, uh, for projects, if you can take people on the process of you making films, uh, like we do and like Maddie does, that's what people will be interested in, in terms of like long term. We did the mistake with Pearl of Africa of doing a web series that was separate. It was just Pearl of Africa. It was a Pearl of Africa YouTube channel. And then eventually we kind of rallied the whole thing around me as a creator. And that's what will be consistent, you know, from project to project. So I think you should focus on just making it about you and your uh, journey to making films. Because that's going to cover from like film to film, it's going to be the same. Uh, and try to tell a story of that. We're trying to tell a story that's hopefully better than the film itself. The behind the scenes is hopefully better than the film itself. At least that would be cool if that happened. I don't know uh, if that's the case, but uh, it's just some rawness that you won't get otherwise. Uh, when you start to film uh, and why I, why I started with filmmaking, I guess. Um, I guess it was just because it was fun in the beginning. I didn't have any like pretentious idea of doing stuff for like Netflix or anything like that. 
uh, it was just like it was fun I did like horror movies like most people do when they start out I did all kinds of like t totally completely so bad that I would never show it I actually did a self-portrait as an application though to one of the film schools which I actually think is good uh, and that is probably what I went back to with this whole channel to make it more personal because I've been making a lot of stuff that is like uh, the people that I follow, their voices. Nowadays, I just think that I'm probably moving away from that and making more and more stuff that's based on like my opinions and that sort of thing, where I meet people rather than I just like observe other people. Um, yeah, eventually I got into docs because I love the process more than fiction. Uh, and yeah, that's still why I do that rather than fiction. I just think it's it's kind of boring to write a script and then it ends up being kind of similar to that script or you're just trying to create what the script is that chase is too boring I just like the unpredictable aspects of making docs uh, that's a phone not a mouse uh, Johnny is your GH5 set to 16 by 9 or 235 16 by 9 um, I broke it though <laughs> I don't know, somebody who watched Maddie's vlog has probably seen this already. Ah, uh, not the best way to use a camera. Now the screen doesn't even work, so... Yeah, gotta fix that someday. For And I also lost this thing that I used for... Well, yeah, anyway. Just put it there for now. Hopefully it fixes itself, maybe. I don't know. Uh, okay, hey Johnny, can you tell us something about cinematography? The topic is, the topic is so interesting. Yeah, I think uh, I, I've said this before, but I think it's so important that you actually kind of do two things. Observe light and, and try to learn how light falls in like everyday life, because that will make it easier for you to recreate that when you light things, but also to uh, to think about perspective so just uh, doing whatever you see uh, other people doing for instance is not going to make your stuff any unique you need to find a perspective and usually that comes out of the story so if you have a story that is something that has some angle or some emotional uh, story in itself that you can kind of portray visually then that's what I would do I would focus on trying to create that for my new film that it's partly about the environments they live in so the environment is going to have like a big role that's why we shoot in uh, 235 and, and want to have a lot of the environment and want to have a lot of wide shots uh, for another film i would go much closer and, and take that perspective just think about like what's right for the for the story and kind of stick to that um yeah uh, okay, let me just take another one from this as well. So, so far we're all good, it seems. No stream worries. Good. OBS is, yeah, I like it. So far, so good. I think it might have had, like, the glitch might have been because I had the, uh, the stream on. Because I'm at my bandwidth maximum right now, so that's not a good thing to stream something at the same time. Probably a newbie mistake to do. Yep. Okay, so let me just go to the bottom here and see what we have. What keeps you... Okay, that. Oh, I'll just take that one because I started anyways. What keeps you motivated to continue want to make such great films and uh, when did you realize this is what you wanted to do? Kind of similar to the previous question I got. So just uh, to elaborate on that, uh, first of all, thank you, such great films. Um, I guess I stay motivated partly because of this channel, because you feel like you put stuff out. As soon as you put stuff out, you feel like it's fun to make stuff, so you make more stuff. So in a way, I think this channel helps because of that. It makes it easier to uh, create stuff because you have an audience all the time. So you feel like you know, it's worthwhile just because there's an audience. Uh, but then before that, I also did it. And then I think it was 
it was much more of a struggle before I let people in on my process. Because as soon as you kind of let people in on your process and that becomes, we talked about this, me and Maddie as well, because like all the stuff that goes wrong, if I break this camera, which I did, unfortunately, but that becomes a part of the story and that's interesting for the story. So I don't kind of dwell on those things. Uh, maybe I would have uh, previously, but now that becomes like a good thing for the whole YouTube channel. So the YouTube channel is pretty much like a driving force as well, just as like my creative uh, drive in itself is. Uh, so if I want to tell a story, that's probably partly like an egotistical thing that I just want to tell the story, but it's also like the challenge of making it and trying to make something that's pretty impossible to make because all films are <laughs> impossible to make. That's also something that kind of drives me. Uh, but you also have to kind of push yourself all the time. So you need to kind of just trick yourself into thinking it's fun as well. Uh, that's <laughs> part of the time you spend doing stuff is tricking yourself into thinking that it's more fun than it is. Uh, and usually that's by not you know, thinking too much. Uh, I just finished a 3D printed lens adapter for my large format camera to mount uh, my pocket camera with MFT mount. That sounds awesome. Uh, yeah, that was it. Okay. Uh, hi from China. Hello. Uh, should I buy a T3i now? Uh, I don't know. I always think that it's like buy the pocket cinema camera from Blackmagic just because it's a solid codec. So if you choose to shoot in ProRes, for instance, you get a solid codec that you can edit with quickly and you get dynamic range that no none of those cameras have because they have so compressed formats and I think the price range uh, with the new uh, Blackmagic pocket camera coming out is just like it's so low the cost second hand for that one now will probably be like 400 450 dollars or something so I would just go for that because that film camera actually holds up for cinema and tv and all those things if you are talented enough so then practice and you'll get talented enough. Uh, James Lou, I travel alone and I don't like to get in front of the camera. Any tips for making vacation documentaries without having to film myself? Thanks. I mean meetings, uh, meeting people, uh, those stories that people have are something that can always like be uh, explored. I think that's the way that I would do it if, if you kind of are um, Resenting the whole idea of being in front of the camera, like just starting to film other people is, uh, is one way, but I would also say that like pushing yourself to actually go out and, and shoot yourself, that's also an exercise that most people would, they would really need it because it took probably like a year for me to feel comfortable in front of the camera and to do this like one way, uh, becoming like me to you. Um, communication because in the beginning it's just you talking to a camera but now it just feels like the audience is there and it's coming back and it's more of a relationship and you can probably sense that in how people are in front of the camera once they've done a little bit of YouTube uh, and I just think that's a good exercise for anybody even if you don't want to do that long term that's a good exercise just as being an actor is a good exercise to learning before you direct learning how actors think and um, it's just good to know uh, so I would push myself to do that as well, but tell personal stories. That's the best way. Uh, Jonas, fellow Swede here. Hello, Sweden. We won. <laughs> uh, World Cup, yes. Uh, I was a Canon pro shooter for 30 years, but they have lost. It. <laughs> I use my GH4 now with Canon lenses and GH5 with their native lenses. I agree, Canon has, has lost it. Yeah, they have. Uh, like, yeah, I don't even know where to start. Like, they don't understand uh, how the new world of filmmaking works. And if they did, they would give away cameras to the top YouTubers, but they don't. So, or even lower than that. Like. People like us, they would give away cameras to, uh, for exposure, but they don't understand this uh, way of making stuff and they are overpriced. So yeah, enough 
of that. Uh, who needs film school when we have your channel? <laughs> That's the way I would like it to be. Uh, like if we would have more funding to do this, that, that it would be full time, then I think this would be like a cool thing to do. Uh, and especially if we can collaborate like we do now with Maddie and, uh, and other people, uh, that would be much more interesting, I think. Because you can have this part of it, which is like Q&A, you can have more inspiring content that's the channel, and then you can have like more in-depth, with which is courses, or even consultancy for like rough cuts or something like that. I think that's like much more... Uh, economically worth it as well you can go and you can pursue your career and it's more important I think to learn how to study yourself learn how to read books watch tutorials all those things are more important than going to school when you learn that you can learn anything at any time and you can say yes to a job which I've done tons of times not knowing anything about the task I'm supposed to be performing but then learning that and like delivering on it that's more important, I feel. Uh, do you believe that it's a good route into the industry by starting as a visual effects artist? I think like any way in is a good way because it, it makes you unique. So the reason I do docs in the way I do and that I make them cinematic is because I had the fictional background and I also had like the VFX and all that background as well before that. So I kind of understand that. I've done a lot of green screen and compositing and all those things. So that I think is, is easier for me to do like a thing like this live stream, which is kind of technical. I did live streaming, I don't know, like probably six, seven years ago, uh, four people. So I live stream with the uh, wire cost and, and did that type of thing with both mobile phones and with cameras, like proper HDV cameras or something like that. Uh, and that was like a thing that I got paid to do uh, and then I never thought it was fun or anything because I wanted to tell stories so it's kind of ironic how that probably made it easier for me to get into it now when I start to see like a future in, in live because uh, I didn't used to see the point of it I saw the point in events like if you have an event and you live stream and you want people to discuss and that sort of thing sure there's a point for that but they never have any interaction going on so it's very inactive in that sense. But then when we started live streaming like this and, and other people too, uh, there's a communication that's more engaging than like a film festival would get if they live streamed. And that I think is like super interesting. And to kind of go back to the visual effects thing, all those things that is your background, like me having worked in music videos, me having worked in TV, and all those things have affected how I work, like as a director and process-wise, how I direct things has been kind of shaped by that. So I think it's important for like anybody to acknowledge their strengths and then develop them and make them like, to what is you and your uniqueness. Um, yeah, that's... I think that's the biggest thing, that if you, if you kind of look towards the, your personal things and then you develop those, that's how you become unique. It's not by trying to make like a style or anything. Like that comes natural eventually uh, when you just do stuff long enough. Uh, yeah. Okay, so... Would you be interested in viewing a documentary or either uh, on either nature or people like refugees, homeless, shot uh, with a high-end uh, thermal camera? Yeah, sure, if it has a good story. Like, it always comes down to that. Like, if I don't care so much about the technical stuff of anything. I just think that, like, if you don't have a story, if it's just, like b-roll that is the same type of b-roll over and over and like it could have been five seconds or ten seconds but now it's a minute you lose me so it it comes down to those things if you tell a story and uh, and all that then that's what i'll watch usually but i just feel like most uh, both like youtubers and i think also commercial directors they're too worried that people will be bored that they don't dare to tell a story that is like personal and slow or whatever it is. Like they lose the whole story because of their 
uh, obsessiveness with like losing people uh, because it becomes like not personal and not uh, emotional and all those things just because you do it that way uh, and I think that's something that's evolving now but it's it's a very long way before you get like the high-end uh, Hollywood effects of storytelling in in YouTube I think uh, what are your top five favorite films of all time? Autumn Ball, Sugis Ball, one. Um, Bombay Beach, Alma, great filmmaker. Ooh, what else? Hmm. Härliga Jorden, Roy Anderson, short film. Great film. So we got three, two more. Oh, now it's gonna get picky. Um, 21 grams, I think. Is 21 grams the one I'm thinking of, or is it? Yeah, I think that's the one. It's not beautiful, right? Yeah, 21 grams is the one that uh, I think I usually have as like a reference point. Let me just check so I don't lie to you. Um, and then I would say kids. But let me check. 21 grams I think that is. All of these are old enough so that most of you haven't seen them I hope. Yeah, 21 grams. That's the one. Brilliant. Okay. That was five. Go watch them this day or weekend or something. <laughs> um, where are we? I lost the chat. Uh, there we go. Do you love making dark or do you do it for money? Uh, because it's easy to sell more than film. Mm, it's harder to sell, actually. Uh, you d don't make any money. I think that somebody counted how much you made uh, an hour uh, as a doc filmmaker, and it was like something like a dollar or like a dollar fifty an hour. That was the rate that you got for making docs. That is not a well-paid job, I must say. But the thing is, I just love making docs. I think that actually YouTube and all this is changing and it giving back the power to the creators. So you're cutting the middleman because you're sitting here watching this, for instance. That gives us, the filmmakers, an opportunity to build something, but it also demands that you change as a filmmaker. You can't be the like autistic type of filmmaker to just think that your stuff is so good and great and you can just be like all uh, quiet about it and then all of a sudden it will blow up type of thing that used to happen like you could be all mysterious and stuff that doesn't happen anymore you need to kind of put yourself out there you need to be uh, the face of your stuff and actually I think that that the showing the whole process stuff is more important than the actual stuff that you make and that can feel like uh, yeah, not so fun thing to hear or live but I just think that makes it more fun because you're the one that is uh, in charge of everything so if you can build stuff off of your filmmaking craft if you can build the courses or whatever it is and if that whole platform that you build make you more independent that you can do whatever you want because you have your own platform that you control then that's a good thing uh, but if you feel like that's like overwhelming and all then i think that like future of docs is kind of dead it's just there's no money in it that's the thing you kind of need to create those uh, platforms for you to create stuff. Um, yeah, you don't make money off of one film; you make it off a career. Uh, yeah. Ooh, uh, how do you convey extreme silence? Muffled audio, very tight pitch noise. Uh, I want to do a scene where a character loses his ability to hear. Yeah, I think that's one way of going. You can like pull all the higher frequencies out uh, down to like the mid mid. Uh, frequencies and then just have like the lower frequencies and then maybe put some reverb on it uh, you can also add 
uh, you can add noise or you can add like the muffled sounds of all the sounds that you're making. So for instance, let's say I, I raise this mouse or something like that. Then you would make that noise uh, a bit, uh, I guess, more muffled, but, but also like some delay or reverb to make it sound more spacious uh, and all those things. Or you just go all quiet and just make like a really slow like drone type of feel and then you would kind of add some points which is like a door opening or like a breath or something that you have uh, to bring you closer as an audience uh, yeah that's how I would probably do it or that's how I do it <laughs> yeah, probably both uh, what's your favorite style of docs fly on the wall definitely um, but I like the mix I want it to be fly on the wall but I also want it to look good and be cinematic and, and all that. So I, will, I like the mix. I hate interviews. I hate archive docs. I just find them so boring. So for instance, like a friend of mine who's the programmer at Sundance, for instance, he recommended Wild Wild Country and everybody has been recommending it. And I just can't get past the first episode just because it's archival. I just, I don't find it interesting. And the story is great, but it's just like the aesthetics of it just turns me off. Um, that's me. I just like the personal stuff. I don't like the ar archival stories so much. Um, yeah, but people have tastes. Uh, what's your opinion on Steadicam versus Gimbal? <laughs> like both have such a specific uh, purpose. I think Steadicam is better all the time. I think just because it's it's less like it's more manual. So it's easier to control, it's easier to do whatever you want to do with it. But it's also more clumsy, so it's a much more uh, like heavy loaded system to have. More bags, a person to operate it, all those things. Amazing system though, that is like flawless, uh, just because it's mechanical. Gimbals have a purpose, but I stopped using them pretty much. Like I use them for effect shots, but I rather have the handheld feel most of the time. But if it is like I do something where I want a gimbal, I'll use it. But it's not that I shoot everything with a gimbal. Uh, far from it. I rarely use a gimbal. Um, how to get... Uh, how to overcome the uncomfortableness and awkwardness when filming? Filming yourself or others? Uh, if you film yourself, I think it's just like do it, do it, do it, do it, until you stop thinking about it. Just like, uh, it's actually the same with other people. If you film other people, you just need to film until they or you stop thinking about the camera. And usually that just means like turning it on. I usually don't want to direct much in the beginning. I usually just want to follow, just so that that gets them used to the camera. So now when we were in uh, Kino, for instance, in Yukon, uh, with Maddie, we kind of just started rolling in the beginning and just see where it takes us. We don't have any, like, we have to shoot this, we have to shoot this today. We had a list of stuff that we wanted, but the most important thing in the beginning is to get them comfortable. And when you invest in that, you get much better result uh, afterwards. And I think it's probably the same with you as a creator. You need to get used to just being there and filming and getting to know the people, and that will help, I think. Um, yeah, and also like, because I see to both Anton and Hayden wants to know about that, like follow up to that and I'll elaborate some more. Um, yes, steady cameras and gimbal, oh yeah, that one I answered. How long have you been doing what you're doing in filmmaking? Since 2003, I think I like studied. I, I did make films though when I studied as well, so probably since like... I don't know, 2001, something like that, 2018, that's a long time, a long, long time, yeah, I'm old. Um, I make dark films uh, using only drones and I'm driven to push the visual language and assumptions about drones. Have you considered drones for more than establishing shots and context? 
not really because I think it stands in the way. Uh, it's noisy, so there's no audio in it. Uh, that's the biggest thing I feel when it comes to, to drones. Um, I mean, drones have a purpose, but right now I feel like they're more in the way than they are. Like they're creating a distance between you and, and the people that you follow. So we actually had some drone shots now uh, in Yukon. Uh, and the second that we bring the drone out, you know that people will get uncomfortable. Sometimes, most of the time, people are like thrilled about it. But this was actually a place where they might not have been. So I heard a story of them actually trying to like go and getting a rifle and wanting to shoot a drone down uh, a couple of months earlier. So you need to know those things that people are like hesitant to drones and that creates uh, a layer that you need to get past uh, before it becomes a, a good tool. Uh, I love drones, but I want to have them like almost uh, as little as possible just to give a little flair but not more than that because I just feel like they're in the way but if you make those docks you see them in a different way and then like that's what makes you unique because you see those things that I don't see so keep doing that if that's what you kind of feel uh, Mario hey man greens from Mexico oh Mexico we're meeting soon <laughs> hopefully you lose <laughs> Uh, what do you think about the new pocket cinema camera? Uh, I am definitely getting it. Uh, I think it's the perfect camera for me, but that's like, okay, perfect in the sense of comparing to the competition. Because I would like a flip screen, I would like a smaller screen or those types of things, but you can't get everything with every camera. But the thing that I love is its sensitivity. I need that sensitivity. I need the small form factor, but still like bigger than the pocket camera. This is actually, to me, this is kind of an ideal camera, um, but the codec sucks. It is really, really terrible. Uh, bad for editing, bad for like compression. It's more noisy than the Blackmagic cameras. Um, and this is not the light sensitive S version. This is the GH5 regular standard version with a broken screen i actually like the mic in this one i use it sometimes uh, just like this with this furry thing um, but i like that it's also mft um, uh, because it's like this small lens like this is so tiny i just like the form factor of it being this tiny uh, i like that the battery is the canon batteries because i have so many of those or they aren't that's what I like about the pocket camera because um, these are similar but the fact that the new one has the batteries I don't have to buy new batteries because I have so many of them um, I just like that they've made a camera that's like small but it's still as good as my uh, Ursa that's what I want I don't want anything less because this is lesser in quality I don't think the 4k pocket is lesser quality than the Ursa probably rather the opposite because of the light sensitivity it's gonna have a cleaner image so for me that's the perfect camera for somebody else it's not because they don't like that type of workflow but I just like that and the XLR uh, so codec XLR uh, input in the camera and then the light sensitivity that just makes it for me that's why I feel it's the perfect camera uh, why don't you show us BTS from your commercial? It's the most thing to learn from it. Um, I do though. We made a series, we made a couple of videos. I'm not sure what all uh, those are called, but we can probably make a playlist or something for it. But I do show uh, a lot of that stuff, but that's also coming. We're doing more of that because we've shot a lot of that now and we usually try to negotiate it into our contracts. Uh, so the more we do now the more you're gonna see that so it's gonna be focused around like the channel will have a lot of that and a lot of the film uh, the BTS stuff that we're doing you should add a super chat uh, yeah, I thought I did somehow it didn't get into this live stream I did though so I will try to fix that <laughs> till the next time uh, it's hard to show, create story in a documentary. It is, 
Okay, uh, is it hard to show or create a story in a documentary uh, more than a vlog or similar short video? <laughs> I mean, when you do a story for like a feature length doc, you need so much progression in, in like a story narrative in terms of like the dramaturgy and for instance, what do the characters fight for and, and how do they develop? If you have a character that's the same in the start of the film and the end of the film, it's probably a really bad film. So you need to get those progressions. That's easier if you make a film for a long time because people change, their struggle changes. So if you follow somebody for three years, it's probably gonna have that progression. When you do shorts, you don't need that as much. It doesn't have to be that at all, I think. So it's easier to make the short forms because you don't have to have that. But when you watch a feature film, you want that progression and you want to feel that people change and you want to get deeper into the story. So that's the biggest difference, I think, story-wise from like short form and long form. Um, that's also what people look for when, they, when you apply for funding and stuff. They, they will kind of focus on that. They will focus on like how the story develops uh, and if you have a story that develops. What show on Amazon Prime has great cinematography and teaches you something? Mm. It was a long time since I watched Amazon Prime, but I would guess... Uh, I actually don't know if I like that so much. No, I can't pass. <laughs> I just watch Netflix. Unfortunately, I, I like Sweden is bad with Amazon, so uh, I haven't watched it in a while. What about Hitchcock movies? Lynch, yeah, like uh, Hitchcock, like Lynch. Uh, but I don't keep them as favorites. Uh, Satya Ray, don't even know. Maltese Falcon, don't even know. Three Colors, don't even know. Um, but I like Lynch and I like Hitchcock, but I feel like they're a bit old. Um, yeah, and also like I'm more of a European cinema type of person, so those films, even though they're good, I don't feel like they're as strong as a lot of European filmmakers. Uh, how do you handle budgeting and writing proposals? Uh, usually Andre does the budgeting, and <laughs> I'm doing a budgeting video because the budget was wrong for, for the whole Yukon journey. Um, so I'll show you in that video uh, how we make it and how badly it can be done. But then uh, writing proposals, I usually write those uh, and that's how I develop my projects. So you have a proposal where you have demands from people. So let's say you do a Sundance documentary application. They have a lot of, uh, uh, they have a form, like a standard thing that you need to apply with. That's how I usually develop my projects. It's not something that I would do probably if, if those weren't there. And the same for like the Swedish Film Institute. You need to write a synopsis in order to apply. And yeah, that's usually why I write it. Not because I need it for myself. Um, but check those out because that's a good resource. If you just look at the, the application forms and then you get like what you need to develop and then uh, you start from there. And then eventually when you've written enough applications, you get pretty efficient and good at it. How do you jump from movies to stills? I rarely do because this camera sucks. You can't really do that. You need to switch. This is the most stupid thing with this camera. You need to actually switch to this because I have these presets here, which is like uh, 4K, um, 1080 uh, and then like slow motion. But to take stills, I need to go into this one, I need to change it, or I need to go to the stills mode of this one. So it's not as easy as I would have liked it to be. I like the way 5D did it. You just press and it takes a picture. That's how it should be. You shouldn't have to go into different menu because then you can't shoot your dock and still take stills. Yeah, so unfortunately. Um, editing stills brings bad habits, wide aspect ratios, in regard to the fourth Yeah, yeah, I just take stills separately. I just think that's um, like it's also good practice. But I would like to be able to take stills anytime because when you shoot stuff, you have these moments that aren't possible to recreate, and then you want to take a still. Um, mm -hmm. 
Let's see. How do you avoid offending communities when making movies on controversial topics? I think you need to listen. That's that's a big thing now with with this film, for instance, because we go into like different communities, and you need to respect the people that you're filming, and you need to listen to their opinions, and and you need to kind of reassess from what they say. What's the tolerant way of telling the story? Because <clears throat> I don't want to offend anybody but I don't want them to limit how I tell the story either so you want to kind of assess what people say you want to talk to both sides you want to have like a lot of opinions and then you think about the whole conflict like what happens if I do this what happens if I do that because uh, it's only by doing the research that you will make like a calculated decision when you don't know enough that's when you make like the bad mistakes and that's when you offend people and that's like if you come from the outside it's very important to do that and especially like if you're Canadian I, I heard now because I was talking to a programmer at Hot Talks when I was at, uh, in Toronto and he was just like talking about uh, how crucial it is now that <clears throat> you don't come into existent communities because of cultural appropriation and I think that's like it, it's an important thing but I think we would, if that happens, if nobody can tell a story about anybody else that's like foreign from them, then we will get a very biased way of living where only like the people that live their communities tell the stories about the communities. I think you need both. Um, and I think that the thing that's lacking and has been lacking is the respect when you come from the outside. It's, it has been a lot of like usage of people's stories. And I think that that's something that you should talk about rather than like cultural uh, appropriation because those are two separate things, I feel. Yeah, like there wouldn't be any cultural appropriation if there was respect, for instance. Uh, yeah. Do you think the most, do you think most YouTube channels right now trying to make money from an ad and review products more than trying to make people learning filmmaking? I mean, I think most know because there's only like a top type of channel that can make money. Like we're not making any money so that we can live off it. Uh, we might, if we were one person, if it was just me, like if I just worked with it full time, maybe I could scramble and make it uh, a viable living. But yeah, pretty much no. So you need to be pretty big uh, for even that to be like a valuable uh, profession that you can kind of pursue full-time uh, and for the ones that has made it uh, I think that's crucial for them to continue making stuff uh, but I think that it becomes a bit complicated when they start doing stuff that isn't true to the channel because I see that all the time with for instance Instagram you see so many like bot posts that is like why are you doing this I would love if like because we are sponsored by Blackmagic for instance uh, for the film and, and for like in general this nice little can you see it yeah uh, board here is from them those things makes it easier for us to make films it's a product that I love I have like how many black magic camera have I had I've had the the micro one I have the pocket one I have the MFT one I had the Ursa one I had like three pocket cameras so it's not like uh, I'm using a brand that I'm not uh, in love with and that's I think important if you do those things but it's not always possible to do that sometimes you need to do stuff that you don't want to ideally you wouldn't but sometimes you need to live also so yeah I think it's kind of complex because some people will take the quick way uh, we have a different source of income so we can kind of do the stuff that we like at the moment but I don't know, maybe it would change if we would do it full time because we have like, yeah, a lot to lose by not paying our bills and stuff. If I want to make a documentary with no money or no experience, what steps should I take? You should start shooting and start doing the research and start filming enough so that you have like a trailer of maybe three to five minutes that's strong enough to get you funding or get people on board or yeah, have a reel. Uh, and then you start looking for funding and start looking for people that can support you. And otherwise I would just continue making it until it's like in the rough cut stage. And then you try again to get funding and get into festivals and that. 
What do you notice are the biggest benefits from using ProRes in editing and color grading compared to H.264? Uh, okay, so the biggest thing is probably rendering times. Like when I did uh, the C300 workflow for the live sessions, like for these, an hour could take like four, five hours to export on my like fancy <laughs> MacBook Pro with it, like everything you can get. Uh, so that's not a good thing. When I had ProRes 444, it's like higher bitrate, better quality, all that. It took 15 minutes. Uh, that's a big deal, I think, when you do stuff. Uh, it's much more easy to edit. You can have more layers. It's much easier for the computer to handle. I don't know if it's the same on PC, but I would guess that certain codecs are more efficient and easily uh, or easier to handle for the encoding process of the computer. Uh, and I just think that if you can get that for free, then you want that. I don't shoot in RAW anymore because I think the cameras are well enough in like the ProRes 444. So if you can have ProRes for that, that's worthwhile. And you still don't lose any information, which you do with, for instance, this one. This becomes quite noisy easily. You lose detail and stuff in it because it's a bit compressed. Now it's 10 bit and it's fine and all, but it's not as clean and, and nice uh, in terms of artifacts. So this is perfectly fine to shoot a feature film on, but if I can choose, I would choose a cleaner image that's more easy to work with. But this is a great camera. Mm, there we go. I'm from Taiwan and I'm a student. What will you say for beginning filmmaker? Make films, a lot of films, all the time and try to find like the personal stories that you like and, and do those like in the personal way because that will be the unique way of telling them. Um, Dale, hey! Nice meeting you too! We had a little meetup there in Toronto. Unfortunately, not enough people uh, was uh, on social media to find out, but me and Dale met. Uh, yeah, that was cool. I would love to do more meetups though. Um, it was just like a messy time schedule there. Uh, let's see. I struggle with visual storytelling and editing uh, after I have a shot a project. What would you say is the best tool to tell a story once, the ed uh, once in the edit after the shooting? Like you mean uh, like editing program? Probably like I, I like DaVinci Resolve, uh, but that's just because I prefer grading and all those things. But I would say like Premiere Pro, Final Cut, all of them are the same. Resolve is the same. Uh, Avid is the same. Like it's just like a scissor tool. It's pretty much up to you what you like and what your computer runs best off of. I would just say whatever you do is, is kind of crucial to work with the material. You probably need to look at the scenes and try to develop that and focus on that and focus on the story rather than what you edit with like edit with whatever you feel proficient with if you can edit in premiere pro then that's great use that um yeah i don't think that like there's one tool for anything i switch all the time from uh, all the programs but the image resolve is free Premiere Pro has this weird subscription base, which I don't like. Final Cut doesn't have that. Final Cut is a great program. I love Final Cut. I just uh, moved away from it because I wanted to have everything in one system. Avid is the best editing software, but Avid is also much more clumsy and, and it demands a lot uh, of your setup and, and all that. But it's what being used on long form content. It's the best tool for having that because it has databases and it also has a way to handle the material, which is different. You're forced to convert material and not work in different formats like you do in the other programs, which is at first yeah, clumsy, but then you learn to love it. 
Uh, Chris, hi from Edmonton, Canada. I'm having trouble getting subjects to participate in my documentary projects. I guess I need to start smaller to build the reputation first. I think usually like you probably need to have like your ID pretty solid and have a description of, of it so that it's interesting for them to participate. But you also need to like come from uh, an angle which is respectful and, and where you let people in and, and you need to kind of find people that are um, like willing to tell their story because it makes a different f difference for them as well. Um, I think that's like an important part of it to kind of think about everybody has an agenda for wanting to participate in anything. Yeah, and if you can kind of figure that out, it's easier to persuade them to want to do it by having those things to negotiate with. Um, okay, that's going to be it for this week. So hopefully this stream seems to hold up, but let me know uh, what you guys thought, because this was like a totally different setup. Uh, but the good thing about this OBS, uh, that program has like a good streaming mode. I can mix in videos. I could do like, a, for instance, a commentary of a film. I could do like zero silence commentary. I could do Pearl of Africa commentary. Could do anything pretty much. Could do feedback on your films. Anything could be possible. So let me.